I had such a long day. All right, it's recording. Thank good, you. For okay, no problem. So um, I want to focus on some of the things that I've, the trends I've seen over the past two, if you can freaking believe it, years. Um, and, uh, so, uh, you know, as we see mega rounds happening in super rapid rounds, like how do we get ourselves aligned with that? And um, I understand that there are was a request to work on sales stuff as well. So I want you to know that the, the principles of storytelling that we're going to learn um, is also very much ingrained in sales. But um, we want to make sure that uh, that, that I, we touch on both. So I am going to touch on the sales. But if you're working mainly on your sales materials, try listening through the filter of sales and see what works Feel free to ask me questions. You can pop things in the chat. I'm going to look every few minutes and answer questions. You know, if it's something you want to discuss, you, you'll be able to unmute and, and, and have a conversation. I really want this to be about you guys. And what I would love at the end, you can start thinking if you want to take me up on this, is to have a few lightning rounds of like your elevator pitch or, or just, you know, the, the beginnings of the stories and what you would use. Um, so I'm happy to watch that, give some pitch back. I'm pretty good at live uh, processing of data and bits and bytes and coming out with some good stuff. So without further ado. Um, so this has been a very interesting few years <laughs> to say the least. And when um, the pandemic hit, um, I went to kind of look at what the aftermath was of 2008. Because for me, um, when March 14th, 2020 came along, which was the day that I got the kids, you know, emails from my daughter's schools that they were closing and emails from clients that meal meetings were canceled and everything, you know, travel was canceled. My parents and parents-in-law that were supposed to come visit had to cancel. Everything just was kind of collapsing. And I was feeling real deja vu to 2008 um, because that was, I mean, I experienced the whole kind of everything freezing, everything shutting down because the minute there's a crisis, first everyone stops in their tracks to see what's happened. And then we see how we, we move forward. Now, um, I, I wanted to look at some of the success stories that, that came out of the last pandemic. So we had the obvious things like Groupon because people were in a financial crunch and suddenly they needed to save money. So that emerged. Airbnb, Uber, the whole sharing economy emerged. I mean, think about this 10 years ago, the thought of staying in someone's house, unless it was an actual bed and breakfast that we stay at, it, it just was weird. But here we are today and looking for homes of other people to, to stay in. Um, Amazon expanded massively. Netflix went from sending DVDs to actually being the media module that we know of them today. And Lego also really expanded through Asia. So there are amazing things that can emerge from, um, from a crisis. But what these all have in common was they knew how to pivot at the right time or reinvent themselves. Um, look at the way things were in the world and see how can I make myself super relevant. Now I've seen companies over the past two years pivot on a dime, like take a technology that was gonna be not relevant anymore and completely transform it, transform their story, transform who they were starting to market towards. So I want us to adopt some of that, even if you're not making massive pivots, the trends that are popping up and I'm not just talking about COVID have to be addressed. So you need to be able to stand out more. You need to be able to rise above the noise and, and really, make them stop and take notice. So what is this child playing with here? Speaking of Lego, right? Lego, any engineers in the room? We have a few. So usually engineers, someone will be like, that's not Lego, that's Duplo because engineers are what we call shit detectors, pardon my French. They will always look for the loophole and be like, ah, it's Duplo, not Lego. I don't trust you anymore. So uh, <laughs> that's that's what they excel at. So who here played with Lego as a kid? Who here has kids that play with Lego or and nieces, nephews? Who here has ever stepped on a Lego in the middle of the night and wanted to commit mass murder of the Danish people who invented this instrument of terror, terror torture? So in an era of tablets and screens and, and, and all kinds of interactive techie games, um, how do you explain that Lego is still one of the best-selling toys around the world? What, what would you say? What's the secret magic of Lego? What do you guys think? Patents. Sorry? Patents? 
patents. <laughs> okay, that's again, you must be an engineer. That's a very techy answer. <laughs> what else? Yes, building, building a different, building something new each time. Building something new each time. What else? Anyone? Down, founders. I'm, I'm not going to do all the answers. Yes, yeah, we can't yeah. Yeah, do all the answers. So we've got building anything. We've got patents. Um, so I'll, I'll give you a little hint. So Lego is the creative expression where structure meets flexibility. We can build whatever we want. We can build entire Lego lands, but we have to stick to the structure. And by the way, that structure is the patent of it. No one has been able to match it, even the cheap knockoffs. It just doesn't fit. Um, and that's why it's so simple, even for a very young child with very limited motor skills to master. So, but the thing is, you can't start bending and breaking and libre kimming and, you know, you, you want to stick to the structure and that frees you. So I want to give you guys the structure, you guys, meaning all of you guys and gals, um, the structure of a winning message based on the art and science of storytelling, that once you get the structure, it will free you from having to try to figure out where do I even start? But then your creativity, your content, your twists and turns come in. So, I mean, I'm sitting in front of a window now and I see five houses across the street from me and they all look different, but I know that they all have something in common. They have a frame and they have a foundation. Because if they didn't, they would not be standing. But it's not like I walk past the house and say, ooh, that's a beautiful foundation you got there. No, yeah, I see the nice lawn or the beautiful panels or... So, so again, um, it's not that I want all of your messages to look and sound the same, but the structure will be what's at the basis of it. So let's take off with that. Um, so understanding what's behind the structure. Um, when we were kids, anybody have like a kindergarten or first grader? Yeah, so it's amazing to see their capacity for learning and how, how much they can learn. Uh, anybody tried learning something new in the past few years? New language, a new skill, yeah. What did you guys learn, Guy? What did you learn? Probably new coding language. Uh, front end. <laughs> Naturally. <laughs> in bad, yeah. what about you? What did you learn? Inbal, you raised your hand. What was your new skill? Well, I learn all the time and a lot of lectures. And now storytelling. Now storytelling. Good. Yeah. Samuel, did you raise your hand or just the snow? No, snow shovel. We just, just moved the snow shovel. <laughs> Out of snow shovel. Are you new to the East Coast? Yes. Yeah, so we're from California. <laughs> oh my God. Oh, I've done the past. I, I started off on the East Coast and moved to California. So um, in, so so would it be safe to say that with our, our brains that are kind of like overloaded now, learning something new at our ripe age is a little more challenging because our hard drive is packed, our operating systems like Windows 19 or, um, or even DOS. <laughs> um, but more than that, as people in general and Israelis in particular, and I count myself Israeli so I can make fun of, of us as well because I got made enough fun of as an American in Israel. Um, so we know everything, right? Very hard to teach us something new. Um, so there's a challenge to get information in. And to address the challenge, they created what's called the principle of chunking. So this is the formula. It's five plus two minus two, meaning three to seven chunks of information is the optimal amount of information for the human brain. Any less than that, we feel cheated. Any more than that, we feel like we're completely overloaded. I say, you know what, four is a good place in the middle. Three can work as well, but let me show you. Um, so I, I want you to it, it, think, that I start today and say, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. We're going to be learning about fresh fruit. We'll be talking about apples, plums, pears, peaches, oranges, grapefruits, a coconut, mango, and uh, uh, jackfruit. What do you remember from that list? Jackfruit, right? <laughs> or your favorite. I don't even remember the list that I rattled off. But if I were to say, hi, everyone, today we're going to be talking about fresh fruit. We'll start off with citrus fruit, which includes grapefruits, oranges, and lemons. We'll move on to exotic fruit, including jackfruit, mango, and coconut. And finally, for dessert, we'll go for the tree fruit, apples, pears, and peaches. A little bit easier to remember? Yes, because they're, they're grouped. And guys sitting there going, but 
but a peach is not a tree fruit. It's a stone fruit because, yeah, I know, right? I, <laughs> the engineer at work, I could see the wheel spinning. So our brain is busy doing that all day long, taking in information, filing it away. Oh, this goes there. Oh, that reminds me, Ooh, that goes there. Uh-oh, something new comes in Houston. We have an unidentified flying piece of information. System will be shutting down in T minus five, four, three, two, one. And then comes the fight where we argue with the person or the flight where we just ignore the person and go on about our day, neither of which is what you want when you're presenting to potential investors or potential customers or potential partners. So for the love of God, go according to their brain and how they're used to processing information. So I want to show you your four chunks of an investor presentation. And later we'll look at this, you know, after we go through these also in a sales sense, but it's very similar. So yes, we start off with the problem and solution. I'm sure there are people that are going, oh, seriously, that's all she's got for us, the problem and solution. Yeah, it's, it's old, it's used, it's thousands of years old, in fact. And there's a reason for that, because if you go back to Shakespeare and Greek tragedies and Moliere and Chekhov and all the greats, they wrote in a very specific way. They started off writing in acts. And that was how we were used to taking in stories and information in the world. Today, you go to a movie, it's basically written in the same way, only it's not like act one, act two, act three, act four. It's all blended together. But we kind of know that the hero is going to win at the end and that someone's going to get killed along the way and someone will be kidnapped and oh, wow. And But that kind of surety of knowing gives us the freedom to just enjoy the twists and the turns and the colors and, and the unique things. So get the structure in place. Believe me, they will thank you because if it's not in this order, they'll be sitting there thinking, now why isn't it in this order? Now there's always exceptions to the rules. And as you move further ahead in your, in your um, uh, rounds, there's gonna be things that have to come up front and we'll talk about those as well. I like to also end with a slide that I call key investment merits, which is like the six biggest wow things we just said in the last 10, 15, 20 minutes that we were presenting to them. They're gonna forget. So we wanna remind them of those highlights. Now, this is not four slides. This is also not 10 slides. I am a vehement anti Guy Kawasaki and the whole thing because Oh, gosh, if you can't explain your business in 10 slides and you do not explain it, that's BS. I'm sorry, because what that has forced people to do is try to stuff everything on 10 slides and make it look like eye charts. And that's not what we want done. So we'll talk about how many slides and spacing it out a little bit later on. There are three things and, and Yael and Yuval, you can, you can leap in here and tell me if you agree or disagree. Um, the investors have told me they constantly listen for when listening to a team. And that's credibility, likability, and momentum. How well do you know your field? How much expertise do you have in it? Momentum is how far you've gotten the social proof, the numbers, the growth, all that good nitty gritty stuff. And then the likability is you. How nice a team will you be to work with? And it's not being the little cheerleader, but it's being people that are coachable. I've, I've seen investors, say, and, and I've gotten to be in a lot of meetings and watch and see how, how the heads work. And one of the things that really surprised me is they said, if you as the founder, as the CEO, after the pitch, and we're giving you notes, if you get that, are not sitting there taking actual written notes on a piece of paper in a notebook, for us, that's a signal that you're not coachable, that you're not listening. They said, you could be scribbling and you could throw it out, but it gives the feeling of a flexibility of thought. And that's what we want. It's not just throwing money at you. It's being able to be a partner for growth. So spend less time trying to argue and more time being sure of what you're presenting, getting the message really clear and structured. And then if they have something to say or to ask, listen, because there might be something to be learned in there, surprisingly. Um, now, we want to start off strong, especially as you start to climb to round A and beyond. So we want to make sure that the traction is up there fast. We want to make sure that any accolades or, or prizes or press mentions that are big, not just, you know, the PR that you did are up there. But what you don't need up there is your team unless A, it's a team that looks like this, that you've got, you know, specific rock stars. It's not that you're not going to introduce yourself, but sometimes people will put a team slide up and, you know, it's a nice group of founders. 
this is their first time, but they don't really have the experience. So don't waste time, you know, talking about everybody's CV, introduce them, and then the team can come a little bit later. But another thing, if you're in round A already and you've already got the track record that you're starting to prove, you do want to put the, the, the team up front. Um, so really investors, and these are all going to be quotes from Silicon Valley partners that I've collected over the years, is, is they want to get the good news up front. They want to get the pow bang up front. They don't want to wait for good news. So don't be afraid to get that brag up there. Now, I call it the brag slide. Please do not call it the brag slide. Don't put a title up that says the brag slide. Um, if, if you have serious traction in growth, and sales and engagement and partnerships and IP or regulatory amazing testimonials. Don't wait till slide 17 to put that up. So you put up like a very simple slide, let the numbers lead. So one of my clients just raised a $30 million round. They had like six rectangles and each one had a number and then like what that number meant. So it was like, um, $33 million pipeline, 70% um, of the market covered by our strategic partners, built-in stickiness, 15, five to 15 year contracts because they're in the rails. So, so it's long contracts. So all of these things are like music to an investor's ears. It's like, oh, wow, that's great. So before they even know what it, exactly it is that you're doing, if you have six massive numbers up there, that will make them perk up and listen. Okay, you got my attention now. So we really want to have that up there. If the if let's say you're a company that's been around for five years and your numbers are not great, I might wait because we need to be able to explain the story of that and we don't want to open it up right at the beginning. Okay. Any questions as we go through, remember, please pop them up in the chat and, and I will answer them, I promise. Um, so the more clients and the more industries that have you know, can, can give you validation, that's going to be a much stronger thing. You don't want to feel, you don't want it to seem like you're spread all the way across, but if you're a SaaS startup and you have various use cases of people that can say this really works and I'm willing to pay a lot of money for it for the rest of my life, then that, that can really turn them into believers. Um, Simon Sinek, who I hope you've heard. If not, he's a lovely guy to listen to. Um, he talks a lot about the why. So that's what I really would like you to start off with and end off with. We'll see. It's a nice little circular closure thing. So he said that people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. So I want you all to figure out your vision statement if you haven't already. Now, this should not be something that shifts. It can if you've pivoted, but at the core, your vision of where you're going with this should be your North Star, your constant, what guides you. So it, there's three layers of messaging here. There's the why, the what, and the how. And you're going to touch on all three in your investor pitch, whether it's a five-minute pitch or whether it's a full-blown 20-minute pitch. But the why is what I want you to kind of twinkle, twinkle, North Star at the beginning so that they understand the, the massive, and you can ask yourself a few questions. I'm just writing an article about finding your why now. You can ask yourself, okay, in five years from now, um, when I've grown up, or our company has grown up, and there's a big article about us in TechCrunch, either because we were acquired or because we had a major milestone or a major funding round, what will they write about? This is the company that did what for the industry? that made some kind of a seismic shift that transformed things, that, that, that enabled things. So you wanna kind of think way into the future of what you will have done. Then there's the what, what are you, which we'll get to, and the how are you doing it, which is demoing your product. And all three must be there. Start with the why, end with the why. I wanted to show you guys a few whys of big companies. Um, I haven't looked at Meta's new uh, why. I'm sure it's changed quite a bit. But um, I mean, Microsoft to enable people and businesses throughout the world to realize their full potential. It says nothing about word processing or presentations, but it's, it's giving us the tools to realize our potential. Um, Google to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. I'm sure Alphabet now has a much bigger vision statement, but that's specifically Google. Intuit I like a lot to improve its customers' financial lives so profoundly they couldn't imagine going back to the old way. Now, if somebody says that about you, like, I cannot imagine life before X, that's amazing. And, and that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of stickiness that we really look for. So shoot big, 
shoot broad. It doesn't mean and a lot of people are like, yeah, but we're not there yet. That's okay. You're going to show where you are on your way. But then the roadmap makes a lot more sense because that's where you're shooting. You're shooting to the moon, right, Elon? Um, but there's different steps along the way. First, you got to hit the road before you fly to the moon or to Mars or whatever you're aiming for. Questions at all about the why? And we can, that can be one of the things that we practice too, finding the why later on. Then we launch into the actual content and that's our four act play, our four chunks that we saw before. So there's two ways that you can start off. It can either be making them feel the pain, which is the stick. And this is usually a cyber thing or, or you know, a health thing, something that could potentially happen to you because it's happened to other people. Or the carrot, oh, hallelujah, this is so exciting. Something good's about to happen. Um, either one can work. It just depends what you are focused on more and what will work more with the audience. There's no right or wrong. Now, I was working on a, a, a presentation last week of, of an incredible company in the life sciences space. Um, and the first slide was very story-based, but it went more for the the knife in the heart. And that's beautiful. If anybody here in, uh, in um, medical devices or life sciences or anything medical, anything life related, anyone? No, everybody's just doing the heart. Uh, <laughs> what I love about writing stories in life sciences is it's so easy because there's the real emotional thing. It's our lives we're talking about. So they are create, they have an artificial pancreas that basically for type one diabetes can take over and create the beta cells that alert the body to produce insulin. Basically, we're looking at a cure, but which is phenomenal and amazing. But I put a picture, I grabbed a picture from Google Stock just to you know show of, she looks probably like she's about nine or 10, a girl sitting there looking like this with you know a, an injection in her belly. And that's the kind of picture that breaks your heart. And he's like, but wait, I want an optimistic presentation. I'm like, yeah, because next slide, you come in and show that you can help these people. So sometimes you have to start by breaking their heart or scaring them a little bit and then come in, here I come to save the day. I am the hero. We are the hero. We will, we will change this situation. We can handle it. So the most important thing is with either of these, the carrot or the stick, you want to then turn it into a story. It can be your origin story. I love working with origin stories. I, you know, I, I remember founder stories from 10, 12, 15 years ago of how they started their company and, and why. To me, it's, it's so powerful and it really shows who you are as a human and what sets you on this crazy path. So if you have a good origin story, you or one of your partners definitely use that. It could be um, something that happened in the world at large, a big break. It could be a specific customer of yours. What, whatever it is, Mark Twain said, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story. Now, I am not saying lie. Please do not misquote me on that. However, you don't have to tell the entire story verbatim with dates and everything. You want to take the essence of the story. So, I mean, just a little example. I was helping a friend. She's an interior designer. She used to be a lawyer. Um, just create like a little video. Uh, to introduce herself on, on Instagram. And I mean, I was writing it and, and, and I wrote, um, ever since I was a kid, I was drawn to, uh, the, to beauty and symmetry, both inside and outside she, in the house. She's like, yeah, but it's not 100% true because I went to be a lawyer. I said, that's okay. As a kid, did you love it? She said, always. I said, great. And I might've taken a detour as a few years to be a lawyer, but finally my passion led me to my profession and I was and each day is like dreaming a dream. So it's finding that story in a place where you don't even think it exists sometimes because that's what's going to resonate with people. Now, people might hear it and say, oh, yeah, I'm a lawyer. I wish I was an interior designer. Oh, yeah, I've always loved doing these side projects. Oh, she's cool. Maybe she has some great hacks for me. So that's the kind of engagement you want to create with your listeners. And also, it's very hard to argue with a personal story. It's 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 you know, investors can argue with a lot of things. When is your own story? A little bit hard to do. Now, why stories? Why are they so profound and powerful? This is my eight-year-old when she was two, Lily. She used to take piles of books and surround herself with them as if she was reading. And I guess this was a 
self-fulfilling prophecy because today she devours chapter books. She's not, she's nowhere without a book in her hand. And um, my girls from the time they were, could, could even, you know, kind of respond, loved stories. They would listen to the same story again and again, even when I didn't feel like telling it again and again, because the world is shaped through stories and through how we take in. That's how we acquire language. That's how we acquire communication. Stories resonate. They, they, they persuade, they connect people. When I just told the story about my kids reading, I'm sure it hit anyone here that's a parent either saying, oh yeah, that's the same thing with my kids. They love hearing those stories or, oh wow, I wish my kid read more. Wherever it is, it, it hits us in a way that makes us think about ourselves and where we fit in. And then what's amazing is a connection, a bond is created. And you know how you say, oh, we were on the same wavelength. It was an amazing meeting. That's not lip service because there have been studies done measuring brainwaves of the speaker and the listener. So when a story is so powerful, the brain waves actually sync up. And what happens in that moment is you have the power of influence, which is a great thing to have if you're selling, if you're persuading invest in me, if you want someone to partner with you, or even if you want somebody to come work with you. That power is a beautiful thing and it's something that's so easy to achieve. So it's not just, oh, storytelling, we want to just break the ice. It's not that. Stories can completely encapsulate everything and translate all of the geek speak into experience. And that's what people remember. I do not remember the CAC and LTV of companies I worked with 10, 15 years ago. I do remember their founding story. And that's what you want to leave people with. Questions about this bit, the whole first act. All right. Now, this is not fluff. This is something that, that is very meaningful. So you want to look at the villains in your company's life. So this list I created back in 2008, 2009, off the wake of the last um, crisis. And hey, there, there, there are a lot of things that people are still working on today that it's relevant. Uh, bad economy. Yeah. Time to market. Yeah. Security vulnerabilities. Cyber has always been and always will be. Um, rising commodity prices. We have supply chain issues up the wazoo now, right? The last three, the boredom, popularizing cultural trend, and missing a great opportunity. Those are the carrots. It's not that someone woke up one day and said, I have this great need to express myself and dance and share silly dances with the rest of the world. So they do it. No, but boredom leads us to do all kinds of things. And that's why they become sticky and viral because uh, someone else is doing it. And that story is like, oh, wow, I want to try that too. I want to be part of this. And then it's look at what stories do and how they unite people on TikTok and on Instagram. And, and the whole world's kind of in this conversation. So boredom, popularizing cultural trend, these are all kinds of things that can be captured for your carrot story. Um, back in March, 2020, uh, when I created this workshop, it was, I, I, I transformed other workshops and kind of brought them together because I could see the fear with my clients of this unknown, of, of what's going on, what's gonna happen now. And this was kind of my stab in the dark of what would be the big Corona winners. So, and, and these are definitely issues. There's lots of others that have emerged, but remote work and collaboration. I mean, look at how Zoom took off and so many others and Hopin and all these, these companies. And yet there's still not the perfect way to engage. We've got metaverse happening and horizon. Will that take over? Interesting to see what will happen with it. Digital health. I'm working with these amazing companies now, one that, that, that is telehealth for neurology using da, 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 your phone. Yes, just your phone, neurology. So, so Parkinson's and, and Alzheimer's, incredible. Money savings, logistics, delivery, supply chain. Oh my goodness. Edutech, all of these things had to be worked on. So anyone showing relevancy to the big money suckers were, had a much better chance of succeeding. So that was act one, the problem, the need. Anyone have any questions about the problem need before we move on to the second act of the hero, the solution? Okay, if you do, please feel free to pop in at any point. Okay, so act two, we have our solution. How are we going to meet that need? How are we going to solve that need? Now, in talking about sales, 
it's the same thing, only you're talking personally about that company's need without saying you guys need this. <laughs> we got to be a little bit more sophisticated about it, right? So what I want you to create here is the simple solution statement, which is simple, but anything but easy to do. My formula is we do X for Y by Z, all right? This is what you do. If I if I say, what are you? You need to be able to answer it in simple. And, so, and usually what I see happening is people will just launch into features without defining what it is that they are. One time you need to introduce with one line what your solution is. And then as fast as possible, you want to get to a, a very powerful demo. Steve Jobs could have stood there for an hour talking about the iPad, but the minute he showed it, boom, we got it. We're very visual creatures. We get it from seeing it. If you wait to demo a product, till the end of your presentation, the whole time people are gonna be trying to imagine what it does, so why wait? Say what your simple solution statement is and just maybe the wow of it and then show us. So there's a few different ways to show us. Um, most important, you want to show the user journey, all right? You wanna show how well you understand your, your customers, their needs and what they want and why they'd be willing to pay a lot of money for this. So, um, what I like to do is always do a user story. So if you have users that have already been using you for a while and love you or even pilots, or if you don't, then you can go to an as if. Here's the kind of company that could truly benefit. Here's what it would look like as, you know, what was their struggle before? How was the onboarding implementation? Just, you know, maybe the basic steps, show it through screenshots, throw it through, show it through GIFs or videos. And then most important, the results. In just three months, we saw a dip in attrition and we saw a rise in uh, upsell and we saw, you know, what are the things and then get a testimonial of how much they love you. So you really are showing your killer features through the story and it becomes much more memorable and palatable because it's not just some cold technology, it's through a company. Now, what I like to do sometimes is talking about the opening story is do what I call a deconstructed user story. So take their problem, their struggle before and bring it to the beginning. I wanna tell you about one of my clients before we start. This is what's their miserable existence before they started working with us. Losing this, gaining that, doing this wrong and, and they didn't think they'd find a solution. And like them, half the industry today is struggling with the same thing. And then you can show how it's a much broader need in the industry. Other solutions simply aren't cutting it because, and then you can kind of like, you want to go with the questions that the investors are asking um, as you go along. So, um, so then later in the demo, come back, let's see their wonderful lives now after they've been working with us. All right. So then it just, it kind of ties it all together and the, the testimonial becomes a lot more real. Look, they're going to be talking to your clients anyway. You might as well give them the testimonials and don't be afraid to ask for it. When somebody writes you an email saying, this is the most amazing thing ever, I can't believe it, I'm loving this, ask their permission to put this in writing. Normally they'll have to put it through legal. If it's something like cyber or something sensitive, they probably won't want their name quoted with it, but you can then say, this is just for my investor deck, can I use it anonymously? It should not be a problem. But anyone that's willing to put their name out there on your website, on your LinkedIn, on your whatever, Video testimonials are worth gold. So, so really make sure you're gathering those. Questions about this part? Back to our solution. Yes, Elian. Hi. You're, hi, Donna. Thank you so much. You just, I'm floored. You just pronounced my name correctly. That oh, great. Happens. Oh, wow. Thank you. <laughs> um, so great to be here. I do have a, you, I think I heard you say, um, that even if you don't have, like, even if you don't have the traction, like at this point, my yeah. user story, I'm convinced of it. And I've talked to enough clients, I'm pre-seed, but you still tell That's it, okay. Right? That's as okay. If. Give us an as if, say. So one of the clients we were talking about is a company that's 200 employees that do this and this and that. Yes. This is their existence now. Then this is what we will be able to do for them. This is After. what it will look like. So you open a window into their world. Not everybody are developers. Not everybody are data scientists. Not everybody are um, finance people. So sometimes we need to kind of like a day in the life of mm -hmm. what it looks like, what their pain is and how big that pain is. And don't forget the numbers. 
because right. numbers are an investor's language of love. Okay, right? so statistics that are out there, like here's my premise, here's my thesis, this is why, this is what the day is like. I'm in, in HR tech is my play, but this is what the day is like, here's the pain, here are the numbers, boom, Accenture says this, Harvard Business Review says this, it's a fact. Exactly, how it will exactly. Be. so you're backing it up with stats data and yeah. numbers, but you're also backing it up with what you've known from conversations of people that are in yeah. different phases of onboarding or waiting for your solution. We've had conversations with people that have said this, yeah. we've heard it from enough people that this is a reality. And it can be proven uh -huh. by market data. Gartner also says that if people don't get their act together, then they're going to end up losing a lot more. Okay. okay? Thank you. Uh -huh. Don't be afraid to draw. It's not that you're saying these are clients I'm working with. You're saying this is this is the as if this is how it will work. I'm drawing an as if. Again, our vision is somewhere in the future. Even right. our first iteration of a product might be into the future, but you're drawing us that, oh, that's the next thing. That's what it's going to look like. That's pretty cool. This is why you need to give me money to make that happen. Basically. Exactly. This is why mm -hmm. I'm here today. I need okay. money to scale this much faster and to Great. get it. Okay. Ready because I have people waiting to put money in my bank okay. account. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay. Excellent. Other questions? Okay. If you do, just keep them coming. All right. So um, then we start moving into act three, which is the hero's plan of action, all right? The business side of it. So if you don't have massive traction, like Eliane said, sometimes we have, we're in pre-seed, our product isn't out, or maybe it's a prototype or an MVP. That's okay. You're not going to have the big growth numbers, but look for what the traction is that does show interest. 200 user interviews where we were able to gather quality data. Um, we have a pipeline of, with a wait list. We have uh, partners that have already signed on with us. We uh, filed for a patent and it's pending. We, you know, whatever it is that you can show, again, this is the momentum. How far have you gotten before coming to ask for money, All right? The further you can get on your own blood, sweat, tears, and equity, it's, it's going to be powerful. You, you, you need to show what, what you have done. Not everybody is just, it, it seems today like they're standing on the street corners handing out checks. Oh, you have a startup, here you go. You have a startup, there you go. Not exactly. We still need to be able to prove that this is a viable thing and that this is going to work and that there's people willing to pay for it. Then there's three things I really want to stress from this part of it, from the, the, the business side of things. It's not everything, but these are the three most important things. One is differentiation. What sets you apart from, from the rest? Um, and this is not how you want to show it. <laughs> so this, this makes them work too hard, all right? If they have to look and see, and what is that? And what do you mean by that? Then it's, they're not listening to you. So don't show your competitive landscape like that. This is probably the most common model. Do investors love it? Some will say they hate it. Some will say it must be there. Either way, if you have a very clear differentiation on an X and a Y of what sets you apart, it can work beautifully. Even a third dimension, I've seen people do like a three-dimensional XY chart, like an XYZ, that can work really great, but that's when it's super clear. Um, another way to show it, and this is if you're entering more the enterprise space, uh, is the uh, IDC Marketscape. So, um, you know, saying we're here and they're there, and this is how we're going to make the leap. Don't be afraid to say, you know, why you will be able to compete with the big ones, because they're going to want to ask it if you are competing with the big ones. So, so what is it that's going to get you there? This is a little bit more sophisticated, um, but investors do appreciate something like this. Uh, another way is just showing the logos kind of like around you and, and where your sweet spot is that can work. Um, this is my personal favorite, the pedal diagram. This is Steve Blank from out of Berkeley. Uh, so this is when you are a one to many kind of play, when it's like you with all these other types of players, not all of them are competitors. Some of them might even be what I call competitors. But with Slack, some of these, they were going to play nicely with and others they were going to kick out of the sandbox. And that's fine. It's just seeing what are other people using today to meet all these different needs when we can either integrate or answer all of this together. So this works great if you have like three, four buckets, tight segments of competitors. 
um, this really kind of draws it. And then what I do on here is I write our true differentiation is, and then write like a sentence with the three things that set you apart from everyone else. Okay. So, so that's, that's a really good one for a competitive landscape as well. Questions about any of these? All right, I hope I don't have to say this, but I'm gonna say it anyway, because I've seen some very painful things. Do not ever speak ill of your competition. I've seen it, it's painful. You never know who in the room was involved with them, was an advisor, was an early investor. And the further west you go, you will see that positivity prevails and, and negativity. I, I guess Samuel coming from California, the East Coast, it's probably a bit of a culture shock. I had the opposite. I grew up in DC and in New York and then in Tel Aviv and then back to California. I was culture shocked by how positive everything is. And then this is what you hear. You hear like, great, amazing, awesome, terrific, fantastic. We're totally gonna do this. And then you'll never hear from them again, right? So how do you know that an American is going to take action? They take action. They, they, they don't, you know, that all that fluff can, can disappear. But you hear, if people hear negativity, it's automatically a red light flashing. Oh, I wonder what they're going to say about me behind my back. So never, ever, ever save it for your Israeli friends when y'all can get together and you know, have a nice gossip fest. That's so, I, I mean, we have an amazing Israeli community here and there's a reason that everybody gravitates together because you can kind of just be yourself because you're kind of playing a game and that's okay. You got to meet the rules of wherever you are. It's the rules of engagement. And the more you know it, the easier time of it you will have, okay? Then comes the monetization. Now, this is how you're making money, how you might make money in the future. Um, there's a lot of different um, models here. So usually it's like your base. Okay, so it's a SaaS model. Um, but in the future, we are also exploring licensing, which will enable OEMs to already integrate it within their technologies right away. Additionally, we'll also have an upsell of a services package, whatever. So you want to establish recurring revenue if you can. That's phenomenal because then it's much easier to project. But if there's other avenues of revenue, those are great things to show as well. And um, opportunization. I know that's not a real word, but it rhymes with monetization and differentiation. So it's easier to remember that way. It's not just about saying I have a multi-bazillion dollar market, which obviously they want to hear. They want to hear that it's a big market because if you're going to take a small piece of that big market, you still want to be able to show that you make a lot of money. This is more the why us, why now? Uh, missing the FOMO train. Investors suffer from FOMO, whether they want to admit it or not. Nobody wants to be the one that passed up that deal. Um, if you go to Bessemer on their anti-portfolio page, they passed up deals like Google. And I've, I actually have, have um, verified the story of that because Susan Wojcicki, who's the CEO of uh, YouTube, she, they were renting her garage when they first were starting up Google. And one of the partners at Bessemer was a college friend of hers. And he came over and then she's like, oh, got these two guys uh, working on a, a search thing. He's like, search, can we take the back exit? <laughs> So I, I know this because Susan's uh, little girl was in um, when was in preschool with my daughter. So I, I had to her at one birthday party. I'm like, I have to ask you if that's true. And she she said it was. So anyway, so these are all fun and good. But what you want to do is let them see into the future of your vision of how big this is going to be, how truly different this is going to be and how they will be kicking themselves. So Airbnb, when they IPO'd last year, this great post of of. Um, this of Ryan Chesky's um, um, reemerged, which it's just simply titled seven rejection letters. All right. And he just had like one sentence to say, just remember when you're getting no, there's always the possibility. So these were seven emails from investors that had rejected them. Get this when they were raising 150 K at a 500 K valuation or something, or maybe 500 K at a 1.5 value, something crazy. Can you imagine if they had, and it was all things like, oh yeah, we just don't see it. It's not in our space. We don't really see the need in the market, blah, blah, blah. But you need to make them see further into the future of why this is gonna be a thing. So I always try to look for three trends that really inform this. The first one is behavioral usually, something, a shift in the market. People are now e-commerce 
took a 65% hike, something they thought would happen over six years now because of COVID or digital or whatever is happening in the world, millennials and their buying habits, sustainability, suddenly everybody's really concerned about the client, climate. So anything that's a behavioral shift that we can actually see with numbers that shows the need for you, that's a good one. The second one I try to look for is either a different behavioral aspect or regulatory. If something is changing in the law and people will have to align with it. So once upon a time uh, with GDPR, a couple of years before it was launching, I was working with a company that said that they had a tool to help companies get fi financial institutions get GDPR ready. And nobody knew what the heck GDPR was because you have two years to get ready for a regulation, right? You know, who cares? And then the regulation hits and people start getting billions of dollars in fines and suddenly he was hot commodity. So the same thing is happening with other regulations now in other realms that just took effect in September of this year. So it could be climate related, it could be um, HIPAA related, it can be whatever, but Companies had usually like two or three years to get their act together. If you can help and make sure that they have this readiness, that's a massive thing too. The third one I try to look for, and this is a bit sneaky, is the heat in the industry. Have big, have competitors of yours raised big rounds, been acquired, IPO'd. Investors, again, they look at signals in the market. So if a lot of heat is being thrown at this way and you can show a true differentiation, that's also great. And then what you can do is bring the competition in after this because it's a nice little segue. So this just raised a $100 million round and this one was just acquired by them and this one was that. So let's take a look at how we measure up and then you bring in the competition. So it's a nice little move towards that. So again, within the buckets, we can play with the flow of the story to work to our advantage. So try to find the trends, the heat, why now? Questions about this? Okay, and then if you didn't put your team at the beginning, it's a good place to put it. This is the team making it happen. You're not gonna have time again to go into everybody's uh, resume, but what are the assets that they bring to the table that make this a winning team? What are their experience? What are the logos of the big places that they've worked? Why, why are we the ones to execute? Okay, again, credibility, credibility, credibility. And then we come to act four. So we had the, the, the villain, the problem, we had the hero, the solution, we had the hero's plan of action and the business stuff behind the scenes. Now, okay, what's next? Now that we've solved this problem, what's going to be even bigger? What's going to be even more? How are we moving to that bigger vision? Additional markets or features or products um, moving towards that much bigger need, the big shift. Oh my gosh, Sammy, you went from snow to city. <laughs> the blink of an eye, how amazing. Um, so what are the real like bigger things? And you can attach numbers to that. If this technology works here, this will also be able to work in additional places such as, and that's a big market and that's a big market. So draw an even bigger picture, get them even more excited. Then you can map out your roadmap just for the, the coming raise, you know, the 18 months, 24 months of what are going to be your round objectives. And it's really important to have KPIs. So what are you raising for and what will it help you achieve? What's your round objective? How far will this get us to 18, 24 months and XX in sales, XX in uh, uh, growth? Um, and, and you can always under promise and over deliver, but with KPIs, um, they want to see what's achievable with your with the money that they're putting in. So you look forward to the end of the race, to the end of the runway, and then work backwards in the, just like a Gantt chart. Now, one uh, Silicon Valley partner who I really like and have a lot of respect for, he, he says, listen, when I'm writing a check now, I'm already thinking about next round because I'm on the hook for that. And if I don't join your next round, that's not a good sign. I want to be proud to join the next round and bring my entire Rolodex with me. Now, unless there's a, they only invest in seed, which is fine. And then they're going to bring people on for the next round. But if they're not investing in your next round, if you haven't hit your KPIs, that's not a very good signal. So make sure you're thinking what is achievable with this money. 
And I would always say, ask for more than what you need because nobody wants to see you out six months from now raising again, all right? You don't want to be cash strapped. You should be focusing on building a great uh, the company, not just raising funding. That's, that's just one job of a CEO. So looking at this again, we've got our Lego set, we've got our need, proposed solution, business plan, vision for the future, and then ending off with, you know, just the six wow points that just sum it all up. Now let's look at the sales. Very, very similar, but it just becomes much more personal and you don't have to put quite as much in the business data. So what is their need? Now, again, we don't want to come and say, y'all need me because you are bad at this and bad at that. No, it's kind of, again, storytelling in a way that shows a need in the market that they might share or a frustration you've heard them voice when you've done some work ahead of time. And then your solution, how it works the benefits, what it looks like, what it would look like for them. You want them imagining themselves using it. Uh, then, you know, your current status, people that love you, that's already working for them. You don't have to talk about the business model. You can, and, and, but, but that might be for a later stage of negotiation, but also how you measure up with the competition. And again, we don't want to diss the competition, especially if they're already using them. We want to be magnanimous about our competition. And then moving forward, okay, what's next? What are our next steps? What's the roadmap? Get them to take one step closer to closing the deal with you. It's not that they're going to sign the contract today, likely. But if we set a meeting for um, needs analysis with the IT team, that's already a step in the right direction. And then your final slide becomes like the value prop. And the six big things is how you're going to make their lives much better and how it's proven using it with others. Questions about either of these, the investor or the sales? Okay. Let's talk about your slides. Um, you cannot afford to have crappy looking slides. All right. You cannot be raising several million dollars and have a billion dollar product and slides that look like a buck and a half. So first of all, if you have a designer, if you work with UI, have give them your slides and let them work on it and, and beautify it and, and make it look great. If you want to do it yourself, there's all kinds of great tools like these, Canvas, Live Means, Live Body Maze, Haiku Deck, Pitch.com. They're, they're always coming out with new things that are either free or freemium and very easy to make a deck look fabulous. Um, and you wouldn't believe how much this really does matter, okay? People, I've seen investors like cringe when they see a deck filled with bullet points and it's just, it hurts. My, I say my eyes start bleeding when I see these. So don't make people's eyes bleed. Another thing you don't want to do is data dump, okay? You don't want to data dump. You don't want people wanting to commit suicide. So my rule of thumb, as opposed to Mr. Kawasaki, is one big idea per slide. Um, so it, it's not getting to everything all at once. It's, it's just making sure that you give them the one big idea of that slide. Now, here's the thing. You compete with your words. If you have a ton of verbiage up there, guess what? They're reading it and not necessarily listening to you. Okay, so it, it's just natural because we take in information through three channels, our visual, our auditory, and our kinesthetic. What we see, what we hear, and what we feel. When we read, the same part of the brain is activated as when we listen. It's not the camera, it's not the visual, it takes it in, but we have a decoding software in our head for our language processing center. So get this, you're speaking, you're saying amazing things, and they're reading your words. They ain't listening to you, they're reading because we've been conditioned if something's up there, we might as well read. And that's a shame because this wasn't a send me a business model. This was coming for a meeting, send me a business plan. This is coming for a meeting so I can meet you and hear you. So one big idea per slide. Now, if you have, you know, people are like, yeah, but what if I want to send it out on its own grade, have another version of a send out deck or a leave behind deck, a teaser deck, something that has a little bit more text on it, but that should not be what you present. But just piggybacking on that, it's the one big idea that grandma could understand or grandpa, this is not a gender thing, this is a generational thing. Or in the words of Einstein, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Okay, so there is a story that goes with the grandma, of course. Um, many years ago, I was training a group of hardware engineers uh, at Intel and a guy gets up to present with this slide. 
and I wanted to die, but I was looking around to see maybe in my lack of technical understanding was, was holding me back. Nobody else seemed particularly enamored by this slide. And then he gets up to present and this is how he presented, I swear. Uh, well, the multi one gig land backbone, the one gig B Mac and the SPI 4P2 of the net processor is interspliced from the backplane into the CSI XL2 switch fire, like literally going through every single data point. I was dying a slow and painful death and I let him go for a few minutes and I said, okay, thank you. That was nice. Again, very American. If someone says, thank you, that was nice. They don't really mean it or thank you. That was interesting. Probably not. Um, so I was, thank you. That was nice. Now, can you tell me what that means? He looked at me kind of like, duh, like, how is this not as clear as day? And then he's like, well, uh, what it means is the multi one gig land backbone, like explained to me very slowly if I was a very problematic child and that still was not working. So I said, okay, let's try this again. Could you explain it to me so my grandmother would understand? And he like perked up and he looked at me with this renewed fate. He's like, you mean your grandmother's an engineer? Really? And he was like ready to hug me and I had to disappoint him that neither of my grandmothers were engineers. Um, I don't know if any of you have grandparents or parents that are engineers, you probably uh, some do, but have you tried to have a conversation with those that are not about your startup? It's interesting conversations, right? And it's on us to explain it to them in a way that they get. It's not dumbing it down, it's elevating your audience. And the bottom line, all he was really trying to say was, Grandma, we're doing a lot more with a lot less space. You know, Grandma, once upon a time, computers took up entire rooms. They were so humongous and they were like very slow too. But today this, your phone is like a bazillion times faster and a bazillion times smaller than those big old clunky computers. Kind of cool, huh? Like your kitchen, Grandma, you know, you cook for 20 people in your kitchen. So again, it's finding their world and where their pain lies. It's not about you. It's all about them. It's not about how great you are. It's not about how great your technology is. It's not about throwing in a bunch of technical comments. And yes, you want to share your technology for investors. You want to have like a high level architecture slide. Most likely they're going to send in technological experts to do due diligence in the next phase. But all we want is for them to get it to resonate with it because people want to do business with people that make them feel smart. People want to buy from people that make them feel smart and heard and understood. People want to invest in people that make them feel like they have something to bring to the table. Not that you know everything already. Okay, so remember. Um, another important thing is you want to know your audience's questions ahead of time and answer them ahead. Um, so, Lucky for you, people are not that inventive. You kind of get asked the same questions again and again and again and again and again. So I put together a list of investor questions grouped into chunks of types of questions. Um, so I want you to be prepared, not just for your pitch, but for the questions you might be asked. So go through the list, pull out the questions you've been asked, pull out the questions you think they might ask you, pull out the questions you dread being asked, add a few and write out answers. Have this as a rolling document, a rolling spreadsheet and let your technical counterparts or your marketing counterparts write in their version of the answer and then go over it so you know how to answer it in an educated way. So don't, this is probably even more important then the pitch itself is how you answer their questions because sometimes they will ask very pointed questions and want to see how you respond. So it's a heat test. When we're presenting remote now, this has opened up a whole world of possibilities because Sand Hill Road has expand, uh, behind, expanded beyond its, um, beyond its physical boundaries. But you have to work a lot harder than when you're not in the same room of creating the trust. Voice is essential to that. Um, Energy is essential to that. Uh, and so one of the things you want is to not put yourself or others to sleep when you speak. So why don't you record yourself presenting and then you watch it back or listen back to it later. If you are putting yourself to sleep, likely you're putting others. So now I want you to try something and go totally crazy over the top uh, cuckoo bananas and present like a home shopping network and then listen to yourself you might be much better than you, you thought you were. It might be not quite over the top and then find a happy place in the middle because usually you're gonna have to go at least 25% more than you normally are, okay? 
Now, Eliane has a question about, it's all about them slide, not dumbing it down, but elevating them. Okay, yes, what's the question? Go ahead. We can go back to that if it's, because it was before. Okay, um, so it was your, I have, uh, actually going back to the paddle diagram, diagram, that was very helpful because I struggle with having different types of competitors. Our product addresses different pieces of problems. Go back. I'm not going to go back. Um, yeah. And so, and so that really was a beautiful, I've always struggled with the competitor side, and that was really a beautiful way to show it that actually we're different because we touch a number of the, of, of the different aspects that these companies are doing in a different yeah. way. Um, mm -hmm. But that means because I have different buckets of competitors, it's mm -hmm. not a simple, beautiful, boom, one slide. Like my, my, my company is, is a new way of, of assessing, um, it basically surfaces up non-traditional but qualified candidates for jobs. So it's it's both a diversity mm -hmm. and inclusion play and some people will want to hear about that and other people won't give a shit about that. And like there's a lot of different depending on the different buckets of competitors I'm talking about and and my one of my weaknesses is that I really am passionate want to get my point across. And what you're saying is it's about them. So how do I do I only focus on, on one, here's what, you know, grandma, here's what we're doing. It's one thing, but actually, in fact, we're doing several things. So and focus I focus on the there. main pain that you're solving, but then everything else kind of is like additional features, additional things that at some point might also come into play, but you have to show your focus on solving the big things. So if the big thing is solving the, the talent shortage. Talent shortage, um, exactly. It starts with yeah. And by looking for non-traditional candidates and leveling them up, that's a great thing to focus on. And that's big. But at the same time, what we're able to do is upskill people. We're people doing right. this and all these other things. We're doing other types of good. Okay. 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 So always go because there's going to be uh, Dr. Evil and there's going to be the mini me's. Always go for the Dr. Evil. Okay. Thank you. My pleasure. Other questions while we're at it? Fear, whoever gets nervous before big presentations, if you are not raising your hand, you I, A, did not hear the question or B, are lying to yourself. <laughs> yes, it's totally natural. We feel it. I, I, I usually ask people, okay, where in your body do you feel um, the, the nerves? And I'll hear things like butterflies in my stomach, heart beating fast, shortness of breath, dry mouth. I call this the pipe of terror. Everything from your mouth down to your belly. It's totally natural. It's, it's a, a physiological uh, response. Now put that aside a think, second and think of the last time you were really excited, excited about a big event, a big opportunity, my workshop today. Just kidding. Where in your body did you feel excitement? Butterflies in my stomach, heart beating fast, shortness of breath, dry mouth. How oh, interesting, same things. Yeah, same, same physiological symptoms. Where's the difference? It's the branding we give it. It's the difference between, okay, wait a minute. I'm feeling butterflies in my stomach. What's going on? Oh, I'm about to present in front of a big group of investors. <gasps> I'm so nervous. And then those butterflies, they go to town. They turn black, grow little fangs. They're like, hey, hey, hey. And they come and they fly up and they choke you and you can't breathe. And oxygen is not getting to your brain and everything's kind of falling apart. As opposed to, okay, what's going on? I'm feeling butterflies in my stomach. Oh yeah, I'm about to give a presentation in front of a bunch of important investors. <gasps> Woohoo! This is exciting. Oh, and those butterflies, they love a good party. They pull out their Burning Man clothes and pop them on and start popping shots of Van Gogh and put on Tiesto. And ns, ns, ns. They dance, they fly, and they take you with them because those butterflies are your best friends if you let them be. They are the energy that you need. They're the excitement. They're the passion that you want showing through. So I want you to think about the last time you gave a presentation that was really awesome and you just felt like you were floating and people were coming up and just like everything just seemed to be in sync. And I want you to take that energy and come in with it because that turns fear into face everything and recover, which brings me to my last point of the day before I'd like to hear from some of you. Um, walk in the room at your best. They don't know that um, you only got two hours of sleep because you had a bug in your system. They don't know uh, that uh, you were stuck in traffic on the way. They don't know that you just had an argument with 
one of your partners and you're really mad. All they know is that you are the person that has walked in the room or in the Zoom. And I'll tell you a secret, they really wanna like you. They wanna like you, they wanna like your product, they wanna like your team, they wanna like it, they want it more than you want them. So bring your best, leave all the crapola outside, it'll wait for you and come in at your absolute best because there is no second chance for a first impression. How many of you have interviewed people? Yes, safe to say that in the first like 30 seconds, you knew if that person had a chance of moving on or not. And you either end up proving yourself wrong or proving yourself right, but you have that first kind of initial feeling. So make sure that you bring yourself at your best, okay? Because you're not gonna get a second shot to make that. So before we turn it over to questions and to pitches on your end, I just want to end with a quote. Um, Stuart Butterfield, again, back to Slack, um, in an interview with uh, Reid Hoffman said, if there were one piece of advice I could give to my younger self, concentrate on the storytelling, on convincing people. If you can't do that, it doesn't matter how good the product is. I could not agree more. So stories are memorable, stories are functional, uh, stories give us structure for us and for them. And again, stories show us it's really about the need of the audience. So these are my details, how to stay in touch. I would love to hear from you all and um, automatically anybody from stage one or affiliated with stage one has a special discount. So if you need um, more uh, time with me, then, then please let me know. Happy to answer questions and I'm happy to hear some pitches. We have about 15 minutes left. We can probably do yeah. three or I'm four. I'm gonna stop the recording just so that if people okay. wanna, um, I'm gonna stop the recording. Um, okay, and don't be afraid to ask anything.